Favorite dungeon type or location? Now, this is more of a general question, but the answer is Trocare. And I have tons of videos talking about Trocare, so let me just kind of explain in general what I mean by Trocare. Trocare in and of itself is a ruined city, and underneath it are sewers, and then underneath that is another ruined city, which is ancient Trocare. And then underneath that are the sewers or other underground rooms and catacombs and what have you of that city. And then underneath that are even more rooms, and then it finally leads into natural caverns and things like that. But for the most part, my favorite types of dungeons are the underground structures and overground structures, too, of man-made origin. So I love the idea of a ruined castle and the dungeons beneath it. And of course, you can have, you know, the even though it's a ruined castle, it doesn't have to be completely collapsed. There can be a, a castle above to explore or a ruined temple and the catacombs beneath or a ruined city and the sewers beneath. And part of the reason for that is if you've watched any of my Trocare videos, you know that I'm overly hung up on everything making sense. Everything has to be perfect. All the details have to be there, where it came from, why it exists, how it's put together. Even to the point where, like, I don't want to draw a map of Trocare's sewer system until I understand how sewer systems work, how they were designed back in the day, and exactly what they would look like. And then based on how a realistic sewer system in medieval Europe would work, you know, like, then I could make modifications for a fantasy dungeon type. But I don't want to just draw out what I think a, dun a sewer should look like or what I think would make a good map and then have one of my players say, that's not how a sewer would work. That, that doesn't make any sense. And then I'd be like, crap, it doesn't make any sense. And now I'm so ashamed. Part of that goes back to in fifth grade, as part of a geography uh, lesson, we had to make our own little island well it didn't have to be an island but our little our own little country and we had to design it and then we had to kind of sell it to the teacher and uh, try and get them to you know buy into it and geographically uh, we had created a river that flowed the opposite direction it should have and uh, it was pointed out by one of my friends in class that we had a river going the opposite direction it should based on the geography of the land. And man, did I absolutely hate that. And so I'm not saying that that's immediately what I think of, but that kind of ties into the whole everything needs to be perfect and make sense. But I do it to too great of a degree. The, um, having play, When you play in other people's games, you see what works and what doesn't work. You see from the opposite end of the screen what kind of knowledge you have as a player versus the kind of knowledge you have as a DM. DMs have a lot more knowledge, and so for them, sometimes, like for me, if everything, every tiny little detail doesn't make sense and doesn't exist even, where you're having to make up details on the fly, it's it just seems incomplete. But from the player's side, you just need a tiny little bit of information, and your imagination fills in the rest of it. Um, part of, so these man-made structures work very well for figuring out where did it come from? Why does it exist? What purpose does it serve? etc. within the confines of the game world. A more practical reason I like them is that man-made structures are nice and square and perpendicular and 90 degree angles. When you map out a cave system, caves don't make a lot of sense on a grid. Uh, so if you wanted to map it out on a grid while playing with miniatures, you have two choices. You can draw the cave system the way a real cave system would look, so that you maintain verisimilitude, but then it fits very poorly onto a grid. Players have to wonder, can I step on this half square? There's no 90 degree turns, there's these gentle angles, and sometimes not so gentle angles. And they just don't fit well onto a grid, whether the grid is square or hex. Then, um, or your other option is to draw it out so it fits a grid very well. You know, you still have, you don't draw straight lines or anything. You draw little squiggly lines. But 
it just so happens that this five foot, ten foot wide tunnel opens up into this nicely twenty by thirty foot cave and then heads off in another direction that happens to be ninety degree angled to the cave. Um so that that breaks verisimilitude because now you have these very room like uh, caves where they should be very not quite so room like unless of course there's a reason you know if you have intelligent monsters living there who have excavated part of the cave out to make it more you know room like but then most people wouldn't excavate out a cave in a nice square or rectangle they do it more circular so even then it still doesn't fit a square grid very well um, I do like caves though. The Hoach, and there's a video on the Hoach, is all about caves and how it would work like a real cavern system um, that's actually, you know, developed naturally through the action of running water through a limestone base and forming these wet and dry caverns beneath. So there is room for that, but for the most part, I like having an, an intelligent design man-made room system because it just fits in so well now there's other dungeon types and locations you can totally have like a lot of people love to find unique takes on it i say unique but just skewed takes so for example a wizard's tower is a classic dungeon there's a tower you've got to find your way in there's probably a lot of magic traps and animated objects that are going to attack you because it's a wizard's tower and uh but what if we had the tower buried up to the roof? So this tower has been there for so long, you know, maybe the foundation beneath it sank and the towers slowly sunk into the ground. Or maybe a huge landslide. Maybe the tower was built at the base of a hill and a large landslide has slid down and buried it up to, you know, halfway or more. That's actually from an adventure that I remember from second edition. Um, a landslide had buried the tower up a, a, a nice portion. Um, there's also a tower that has fallen over. So now you're going through these rooms, but the rooms are all sideways. So every room has just a pile of junk at the bottom because all, all the furniture and everything in the rooms fell down. Um, I've also read of an adventure where the entire tower was upside down. Um... There's adventures that take place inside giant trees. There's adventures that take place inside the corpse of a gigantic creature that died long ago. There are adventures that take place within the tunnel system carved by a purple worm. Um, so there's a lot of these tunnels going around, and then eventually you find out that, yes, there's still a living purple worm crawling around the place. Um, there's adventures that take place in the vast Underdark, which is kind of like a giant underground society. But because it's underground and there's, you know, dirt above you all the time, you can have weird tunnels going off in weird directions that you wouldn't normally have. There's adventures that take place in giant sunken ships, but it's all underwater. And sometimes the ships sink, but there's still air bubbles trapped in them. So there's rooms with air and rooms without air. Video games are a good place to find those, too. I think this video has gone on long enough to say that my favorite type of dungeon is underground man-made structures. But that's the way it works. Until next time, bye-bye.